So um, welcome to the first of this year's um, four Genome Sciences Public Lectures. So my name is Leo Polank. Um, I'm a faculty member in the Department of Genome Sciences. And uh, I'm just going to take a couple of minutes at the beginning to make a couple of uh, uh, statements about the, the series and uh, introduce tonight's speaker. So this is the ninth year that our department's been doing this series. And, um, and we do it basically for you guys, right? We just, we're, we're doing this to kind of acquaint the general public with the kinds of things that go on in the Department of Genome Sciences. And so um, I'm always happy to see when we get a really good turnout, because like I say, we're, we, we really are doing this for you guys, really. So it's great to see you guys all showing up on a, on a really precious summer evening in Seattle. So um, the series was actually originated by Stan Fields, another faculty member in our department. And then Stan subsequently passed the torch to several other people who took over the series. Um, I, I took it over for a few years, but I passed the torch this past year to uh, another colleague, Elhan and Bornstein, and he's the one who actually organized the series for this year. In fact, he would have been here doing the introduction, but he had a conflict tonight. So he gets the credit for this year's series. And then also I should thank Carleen Cross, our department events coordinator. She, she plays a really important role uh, because she actually sends us email messages at a certain point reminding us that this series is still going on and that we should invite speakers. Uh, she also arranges to have refreshments brought in um, at the end of the talk. So actually what I'm going to tell you right now, this is a helpful reminder, that following the talk, um, Ray has agreed to stick around for a while. So if people want to ask questions, we serve refreshments out in the um, lobby outside the lecture hall. So you guys should stick around and feel free to ask him any questions that you were uh, unable to ask during his talk or you're too shy to ask because there's too many people in the room. Um, but he'll be available so you can speak to him one-on-one. -on -one. So um, let's see. Um, so anyway, let's on to Ray. So it's my great pleasure to introduce Ray Monnet as tonight's uh, seminar speaker. Um, and just a little bit about Ray's background. He received his bachelor's degree at the University of Wisconsin. He then went on to get a, um, his MD degree at the University of Chicago. Then he did postdoctoral work here um, in the Department of Pathology, um, working with George Martin and Larry Loeb. Um, in the department, and, uh, and then after after that stint as postdoctoral work, he took on a faculty position here, and he's currently a professor in the, with joint appointments in the departments of genome sciences and pathology. He's also the co-head of the Cancer Consortium Cancer Basic Biology Program that's affiliated with the University of Washington Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center, and um, and Children's Hospital. Um, and although his talk tonight is on cancer. He actually has interest in a number of other areas. His lab research is a number, number of other topics, including he's worked on a lot of work on Werner syndrome, which is a really fascinating premature aging syndrome. He's, uh, he's in, his lab is involved in the development of genome engineering tools. Um, he also is interested in the molecular determinants of cancer therapeutic response. And he's also just generally interested in the effective uh, um, genetic variability on um, traits, on human traits. So. Um, so just before I pass the, pass the torch on to, to Ray, I just want to sort of one personal anecdote. Um, Ray's also a great, a really nice guy and a really terrific colleague. And I actually got my, an independent assessment at that point because I went to a, shortly after I started here as a faculty member, I went to a party that was uh, attended by several of the people in Ray's lab. And Ray wasn't there. And usually when the, the person who runs the lab is not present, the people that are in the lab are free to speak about that person, whatever they will speak, right? So, um, but there was somebody in Ray's lab who, I, I didn't really know Ray very well at that point. I just started here. And um, somebody in his lab said, you know, Ray's one of these rare guys who's been really successful, but he's also a really nice guy. And in fact, I found that to be absolutely true of Ray. Um, in fact, when I was writing my first NH grant, Right at the 11th hour, just before it was due, I ran over to Ray's office and said, would you mind giving me some comments? Really bad form to do that. But Ray actually read the whole grant really thoroughly. He had, it was a very humbling experience for me because there was a lot of red marks all over my grant. But, it was a, but, but that was, those comments were incredibly helpful. And in fact, I got that grant and I owe that success to Ray. So I think Ray's, uh, his associate that described him as a really nice guy who's, who's been successful, one of these rare characters who's really nice and really successful. Absolutely accurate. That's my opinion of him as well. So, okay, so title to Ray's talk tonight. Well, there it is. I don't have to say it. So, thank you, Ray. Yeah, this seems to be on. Are we good in terms of volume? People can hear? Excellent. Okay. After that introduction, I should probably stop. So anything I could say would be a detraction. Thanks, Leo. 
And I want to thank everybody for coming out tonight. Uh, it's a beautiful summer evening. I hope what you hear stimulates interest uh, in several areas. And as Leo mentioned, I'm happy to stay around after uh, to talk about anything that you hear tonight or anything that's a related topic. So um, when, the, when El Hanan was putting the lecture series together, he approached several of us and asked us what we wanted to talk about. And because I've been thinking a lot about cancer and cancer therapy and what determines the success or the failure of cancer therapy, I thought it would be a good topic to talk about uh, for this audience, both because it's an area I think of intrinsic interest to lots of you, as I'll show in a moment, and it's also an area where there has been an unbelievable sea change in the last decade in terms of our understanding of this as a disease process, as I hope to show you, and also how that's beginning to inform um, approaches to better and more effective therapies for lots of different types of cancer. So this is the outline for um, what I want to do. I have to give you some background, and I, I didn't assume anybody in the room really knew anything uh, at any level of sophistication about cancer. So I want to highlight a couple of things that I think are central to understanding cancer as a disease process. And part of this is historical development of our thinking about this as a disease process, um, from something that, that was an anatomic disease to something that really had the essence of the disease at the level of individual cells and this revolution of the last decade has really been driven by the idea that cancer is a genetic disease at the level of individual cells and it's that genetic aspect of cancer that explains what it is and it also explains what therapeutic options we may have. So the central theme, one of the central themes that will come from this is the idea that cancer really is a genetic disease in a very fundamental sense and that determines both what it is and it also determines in ways we'll discuss in the third section how we can use things that are mutation or mechanism guided as new approaches or new ways to think about cancer therapy. And I'll try to illustrate these with specific examples as we go along. So I wanted to make this uh, a story that had some historical flavor and connected with individuals uh, that had made significant contributions. And these are some of the people. You may recognize a few of these individuals. For instance, Ruth Bader Ginsburg or our illustrious former Vice President, Dan Hoyle, who will help us in different ways to illustrate this story. So we'll come back to these. You'll see them pop up at different points in the story. I guess I need to do a disclaimer at this point. I have one or two things I'm going to show as pathology specimens. And I'll show blood cells, but not blood. So if you're squeamish, uh, you don't have to look at those slides. There are only one or two of them. I tried to keep them at a minimum. But I think it's important to emphasize certain aspects of cancer that you actually see something because the graphic image, I think, is important to a conceptual understanding. So I've shown a couple of these and, uh, at both the gross pathology level and the microscopic pathology level. So one of the um, first things I wanted to do is emphasize the, the impact, the public health impact of cancer as a disease process. This is a table that was taken from the American Cancer Society and it ranks leading causes of death worldwide in developing and developed countries. These are 2004 statistics, but they're not that much different today. And I've highlighted in red here the role of malignant neoplasms, cancer in aggregate, as a contributor to death um, yeah, worldwide. You can see in terms of totals here, it's 12.6% of deaths, but I think as many of you know in the developed world, of which we're a part, it's over a quarter of all deaths are attributable to malignant disease. Um, this trend is going to head this direction because developing nations are part of the aging world population. So I think we can anticipate the number of uh, deaths in developed countries and those in developing are going to closely approach one another in the near future. Another way to look at this in the context of the United States is to look at um, ca adult cancer deaths, and these are American cancer systems society statistics. Um, these are from 2014. Uh, they're divided by gender, men and women. As you can see, um, cancer is, is basically an equal opportunity uh, disease in the sense that it attacks both genders um, with some differences for things that are sex-specific epithelia, such as prostate in men, breast in women. And you can see that there are many different types of cancer that contribute to this total over the course of the year. And this is one of the underlying themes that I hope you take away from this talk, which is that cancer is not one thing. It's not one disease. It's not a single disease entity. And as we'll point out, even in the context of a particular type of cancer, there's a lot of heterogeneity, and it's understanding that heterogeneity that's beginning to give us the clues to new and effective forms of therapy. 
our thinking about cancer as a disease process, as I emphasized at the outset, um, really developed in the middle of the 19th century with ideas about the basis for life. And, and I think many of you know, if you've studied basic biology, that one of the units of life is the cell. And this was an idea that did not originate with this gentleman, Rudolf Virchow, but Virchow was a German pathologist who was intimately familiar with thinking that was developing at that time about the cellular basis of life. And he said, if life is based on cells, then disease must also be based on cells or when things go wrong with cells. So he was very prescient, I think, in recognizing these two streams, one of medicine and pathology on the one hand, and one of the cellular basis of life on the other, and brought these together in the context of a book entitled um, Cellular Pathology in 1858. Interestingly, this is the same year, I think, Darwin published Origin of Species. Um, and he followed that um, in the early 1860s with a multi-volume work that was focused explicitly on the idea of cancer as a cellular process. So he was um, essential, I think, in, in solidifying our, a lot of our thinking at this end point and emphasizing that cancer was a different variant of what we thought the basis of life was, but it was a cell-based process. And a lot of our thinking about the disease has really grown from that point. Um, these are two pictures of Virchow early and late in his career. He was a really interesting guy. He had a lot of interest in public health and sanitation, made many contributions in addition to being one of the towering figures of the 19th century um, to the field of pathology and to cancer. And it's worth uh, uh, probably at least doing the Wikipedia lookup if you'd like to know more here. Trying to get a handle on the nature of cancer as a disease process has been a vexing issue. And between Virchow in the early part of the 20th century, a lot of people took a stab at a definition. And the one that I liked the best um, was actually uh, developed by a guy by the name of Rupert Willis, here shown in a photo from the 1930s. He was a British pathologist. He spent a lot of time looking at tumors. He was intimately familiar with the ideas that Virchow had popularized, that this was a cellular disease process. And he used those, and he put it together with his clinical observation day in and day out working as a diagnostic pathologist looking at tumors to try to understand what the essence of this disease process was. Because his idea, and I think it's still an entirely valid idea, is if we don't understand what we're dealing with, we're not going to be able to deal with it effectively, either as a clinical or a biological problem. So he came up with this somewhat wordy definition. Um, I want to highlight a couple of aspects of this because these are things that he identified that really served as a conceptual and a practical basis for pathology and thinking about cancer as a disease process. One of the first things he emphasized is this is a disease of cell multiplication and it's, it's not very well controlled as a process. So excessive cellular proliferation is an important part of this. Equally important, the ability of cells to divide and to differentiate into a mature and appropriate cell type is altered in cancer. So these two defects, excessive cell proliferation and abnormal or incomplete cellular dif dif uh, differentiation are really linked and they're at the heart of uh, cancer as, as a biological disease process. And we'll talk a little bit more about the origins of these. Um, Willis was also quick to point out differences between cancer as a disease process and other things that go on in the body and can occasionally be confused with it. And he distinguished this from things that are physiologic or adaptive hyperplasias. That's a big word. One of the most um, familiar aspects of this or familiar examples that I'm sure all of you are familiar with is wound healing. If you get, you know, you're home cutting vegetables, you cut your finger, this will typically heal over time, and that's an example of a physiologic hyperplasia that involves cell proliferation and differentiation. But in contrast to cancer, it's a self-limited process. It's appropriate to the injury, and it stops at the end of that self-limited process with a healed, in this case, knife wound. Um, a couple of other aspects of cancer that uh, Willis and others recognized is that often we don't know where this has come from. Um, the origins of cancer is a whole other lecture, fascinating story in its own right. He recognized, as I think most of us do, that this is a progressive and usually irreversible process. And I don't know if he included this um, for a deep or a fanciful reason, but he said, as best he could see, tumors serve no useful purpose in the body. They're sports of nature. They're there. Many times we can't avoid their occurrence. And they have these key features. 
Interestingly enough, this definition served as the basis for the diagnosis of pathology, and there are three aspects of this that um, are basically the keys to recognizing pathology if you practice as a pathologist and look at uh, tissue sections under the microscope. The idea that you have an abnormal proliferation, a pathologic hyperplasia is the, the technical term for this. There are too many cells. This idea of a cell differentiation defect that is either disordered or a failure to differentiate or the differentiation into many forms, heterogeneity, is again an expression of a linked defect in cell proliferation and an inability to go completely to a normal cell type as evidenced by the completion of a differentiation program. So cell proliferation defects, um, uh, cell uh, uh, proliferation and differentiation defects are two of the key morphologic indicators of the presence of a tumor. There's a third aspect of this, which, which is that the way that the body is normally set up and develops, once you have a mature form, that's maintained over time. Cells have a particular place in the body, they have a particular form, they have a particular function, and this involves cell position control and differentiation, and these are lost in the context of many forms of cancer, especially the more malignant or virulent types of cancer, through the process of invasion and metastasis. Invasion is the adjacent tissue spread of a tumor, metastasis is spread to and growth at a distant site in the body. So these are two of the more ominous outcomes of a malignant neoplasm. One that has a poor prognosis is that they're starting to do damage to normal tissue. Um, I'll show you two examples of uh, these first two defects, the proliferation and differentiation defect. And to do this, I'm going to use peripheral blood as my tissue. Uh, so this is a photomicrograph. If I took a drop of blood out of any of you, smeared it on a slide and stained it, it would look like this. And in the background are red cells. All of these things with the pale centers are red cells. These are what uh, the hemoglobin in this when it's oxygenated is what gives red, uh, a red color to blood. In addition, there are a smaller number of cells that are white cells. These are typically thought as host defense against invading bacteria or other infectious agents. And those of you with good eyes can see a couple of other things on here that may look like but in fact are not dirt. These are um, platelets. And these are the cell fragments that are generated from a cell lineage called the megakaryocytic lineage. And what they do is their first line of defense in terms of initiating blood coagulation. So this is part of the hemostatic response. If you cut a blood vessel, these will aggregate at the site. They'll um, elaborate a lot of things that promote a blood clot at that site as a way to stop um, bleeding. So this is what normal peripheral blood looks like. And I think you can see um, just going to the next example here from a, a blood smear from an individual with a type of leukemia called chronic myeloid leukemia, that you have differentiation defects. You can see some cells that clearly look abnormal in contrast to things that show more normal differentiation. The megakaryocytic lineage now is a st starry sky. You have many more platelets than you have in a typic, typical blood smear. And if you start to look at the red cells, you can see there um, many of them are either uh, variable in terms of size or variable in terms of the amount of hemoglobin, how clear the center is. And there are some that actually have little uh, uh, toxic bodies incorporated in them. So th this is a pretty graphic example. It's an easy example, I think, to show those two key aspects of neoplasia as a disease process. Inability to keep track of cell number and control it appropriately and an inability to make sure that cell differentiation goes to completion to generate things that are appropriate in terms of appearance, function, and number. I want to talk about one other aspect of the pathology of cancer that I think is important to emphasize. Um, and this relates to the fact that uh, the type of cancer is really age-specific, and there's a clear divide in the major types of malignant tumors between those that dominate in adults and those that are seen predominantly in children. This is a very simple classification of the sources of tissue that give rise to tumors and whether they're a good prognosis or a poor prognosis tumor. The poor prognosis tumors are, go under general terms of carcinoma. These are epithelial derived or sarcoma. These are derived from basically everything else inside the body, stuffing as I call it. Or the supporting, conducting, and blood-forming tissues. 
And one of the things that's striking is that 90% of adult oncology is really focused in the box on the upper right, whereas 90% of uh, childhood oncology is in the box on the lower right. So these are fundamentally different types of tumors. Um, we won't have a chance to discuss this tonight. Fundamentally different types of disease that have different genetics. And equally important, the care of individuals with these two types of tumors is really specific in the sense that you need to go to people that have expertise in one or the other. So general oncology is sort of a misnomer. You need to think about something that's um, tumor and patient specific and appropriate. I want to talk about one other topic here in terms of um, clinical presentation. And this is the idea of uh, how tumors come to clinical recognition. And the ideas I want to present here is that there are basically two ways you know you're in trouble with a neoplasm. And these are by virtue of the fact that this is a, an unrestricted or largely unrestricted growth process. And another aspect that's more biological, which is that tumor cells are living entities. And they can actually be biological factories. And they can disrupt normal physiology as a result. So my example of tumor as growth is uh, uh, a sitting justice of the Supreme Court, uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And I love to teach with examples. This is one example I use in med school teaching. And this is from 1999 when Justice Ginsburg was hospitalized. And she had a segment of her uh, distal large bowel removed because she was found uh, to have, have an, inc in an incidental exam for what was thought to be another problem a cancer of that portion of her colon. The details are down here. There was no suggestion that it had spread very far. And I think all of you know uh, Justice Ginsburg continues to sit on the court and render opinions um, unfazed by this and many other problems, including uh, several of her colleagues. <laughs> so tumor is growth. Again, the idea here, and this is not Justice Ginsburg's colon specimen from surgery. This is another one to emphasize where her tumor was located, large bowel. And it was in the distal portion of the large bowel. And her tumor resembled something like this, where there was normal bowel downstream, normal bowel upstream. And here circled in red was something that had begun to grow as a malignant tumor that had arisen from the epithelium of the colon. This is a really common type of tumor, um, colon cancer. It's slow growing, and it will eventually invade out through the wall and spread in the body if it's not stopped. So this is an example of a clinical presentation of a tumor as growth. And it's a common presentation. It is usually late in the history of a tumor because you have to accumulate a lot of tumor cells over a long period of time for this to start to interfere with normal physiology and normal function of the colon. Tumor's factory is a little bit different idea, and this really takes its uh, origin from the idea that tumor cells are living entities. They can make things that inter interfere with normal physiology. And my example of this is, uh, is the 44th um, Vice President of the United States, Dan Quayle. Um, Dan had lots of misadventures in office, but this was a post-office misadventure, and it started in an odd way. He was a young, reasonably healthy guy when he left office. And he suddenly started to come down with odd maladies. He had what seemed like an appendicitis. Then he had these blood clots that were unexplained, for which there was no apparent reason. And in looking a little bit more carefully at his history, um, it was realized that, um, in fact, something was going on. He had not an appendicitis, but he, he had an unusual tumor of his appendix, and a mucinous cystadenoma. We don't need to worry about the details. Um, but one of the things that was interesting about it is that this is a tumor type that actually makes a procoagulant. It's something that can stimulate blood clotting in the body. And despite Lawrence Altman's speculating that there might have been a link here, um, this was probably, in Dan Quayle's case, almost assuredly the explanation for unexplained vascular thromboses in conjunction with what seemed like acute appendicitis. He had an unusual clinical presentation of a tumor tumor is factory in which the tumor cells were making something that stimulated inappropriately blood clotting. And that's how he first came to clinical recognition. His tumor was recognized, he was operated on, and he continues to play golf today. So. <laughs> but the idea here is that there are many of these types of syndromes where tumor as factory can give rise to disrupted physiology. And that disrupted physiology is how we come to know the presence of the tumor. 
And you can see there are a long list of these that can interfere with endocrine function, neuromuscular function, um, skin, bone, soft tissue, vascular. These were the coagulation defects and thrombosis that Dan Quayle had because, uh, because of his appendiceal tumor and a form of renal failure. So these can be a first clue, and in contrast to presentation of a, a tumor as growth, these can be early in the history of a tumor, as Quayle's was. His tumor was quite small. But they came to clinical recognition because they made potent bioactive molecules that triggered inappropriate blood clotting. So this is the sort of end of what I wanted to do in terms of descriptive pathology to give you a little bit of a sense of the history of pathology um, and also some of the key aspects of this disease. It's a cellular disease process. The pathologic anatomy here allows us to classify this. And there are um, many aspects of this that reflect the tumor tissue of origin and the type of tumor. And it's a recognition of the nuances of this that drives our classification of different types of tumors. This is the language of clinical oncology, and it's basically the decision point that uh, uh, determines where you go in terms of therapeutic decision making. A key aspect of this we've appreciated is that biology begins to determine the behavior of the tumor. And as I've just illustrated in our two examples, um, uh, from the popular press and uh, politics and the Supreme Court, um, there are two clinical presentations, two general types of clinical presentation you can think about that represent the fact that this is a continuous growth process that eventually interferes with normal structure, or it's a living entity that can make things that start to interfere with normal physiology. So I want to go on to the um, second of the topics that I wanted to talk about, which is cancer as a genetic disease. This is a genome sciences summer series. So I think uh, um, I wanted to come back to this in a serious way. And I wanted to start by talking about some of the lines of evidence I'm sure many of you have heard to argue that cancer is in some way a genetic process, not necessarily an inherited process, but a, a process that has genetics at its core. Um, one of these is the observation uh, often made that cancer runs in families. Um, we know of rare inherited cancer predisposition syndromes. I work on several of those where an inherited defect can predispose you to cancer. Anything that leads to increased genetic damage, whether it's inherited or from the environment, things like sunlight, chemicals, radiation, can increase the risk of cancer because you're interfering with um, tumor cells. Um, cancer cells are often genetically abnormal, as we'll see, and specific tumors may have specific mutations that in one of the examples I'll show has been instructive in several ways about the underlying biology of this as a disease process. I think in terms of uh, cancer running in families, many of you are familiar with the work of my genome sciences, Leo's genome sciences colleague, Mary Claire King, who made seminal observations and continues to work on the genetics of breast cancer as one example in the department here of someone who has a serious interest in inherited and acquired defects. And Mary Claire has also been instrumental in developing um, diagnostic uh, strategies to look at individuals in terms of breast cancer risk, just one type of activity that's ongoing. Um, what, the example that I wanted to start with um, comes from the disease that we saw the blood smear of just a moment ago, chronic myeloid leukemia. And this was one of the first consistent genetic abnormalities that was identified in association with a particular type of cancer. These two people, uh, Peter Knoll and David Hungerford, were in Philadelphia at that point. They recognized in chromosome smears, this is a metaphase chromosome smear from an individual with this disease, CML, that there was this new minute chromosome, as they called it. And because they were in Philadelphia, they, they called it the Philadelphia chromosome, or PH1. To the best of my knowledge, there's never been a PH2. Um, but PH1 turned out to be interesting from several points of view. This, by the way, was discovered only a few years after we finally came to the conclusion that, that the, there were 46 chromosomes in the human chromosome complement. So, so this was an interesting find, and it is very consistent. And in fact, it's diagnostically useful. The availability of things such as that minute chromosome and the ability to track it through the growth, the growth of a tumor um, led to the idea that this is a progressive process in which a genetic abnormality that was present at the beginning, that minute chromosome, could be carried forward and could actively contribute and might drive this process. And this uh, identification of the, this minute Philadelphia chromosome in chronic myeloid leukemia
played into an idea that had been developed by a British experimental pathologist by the name of Leslie Folds, who collected a lot of experimental data on tumors and animals, as well as from clinical observation, and said cancer is really a, a moving stream or a moving process. And he coined the term tumor progression for this, and he likened this to what was basically evolution occurring on a small scale in a tumor in an individual's body. So variation, the sort of y-axis here, time, the x-axis is something where you can have progressive diversification and change over the life history of a tumor in the body. And this is an important process in many tumors. It's rapid in some tumors, not in others. But the recognition that this had an evolutionary component that was driven by genetics, or mutations rather, was a key observation that uh, uh, really solidified first in the late 60s. And then in 1976, Peter Knoll, the, one of the discoverers of that Philadelphia chromosome, drew this diagram in a paper he published in Science that tried to encapsulate the idea that this was a disease that started from a single cell, grew over time, and with time diversified into different compartments that could be either antigenic or not, drug resistant or not, or able to spread to distant sites in the body. So this was an important conceptual idea that cancer was not a one thing and it was not a stable thing. It was a moving process. Another aspect of this evolutionary idea and the ability to find additional markers, like that Philadelphia chromosome, that new minute chromosome in leukemia, allowed people to infer the number of cells from which tumors arose. And there was important work done on this process here. Um, Stan Gartler, a genome sciences colleague in the late 50s and uh, early 1960s, identified additional markers that allowed you to trace the origin of cells in a tissue and infer how many cells that they arose from. And the former um, chair of medicine and dean of the School of Medicine here, Phil Fialco, um, rapidly developed these ideas in the 70s that, and between work that Stan initiated and Phil and many other labs completed, the idea came, came to the fore that many tumors, in fact, as Peter Knoll had driven in his diagram, really arise from the transformation of a single cell that over time changes and accumulates genetic variation. So this idea that many tumors arise from single cells was a second aspect of this that came from the recognition of consistent genetic change or genetic markers that could be used to track this process and work our way back and infer that because all of these cell lineages and blood were affected and had the marker that the cell that linked all of these was further up the developmental tree of blood and that the change, or that first cell that underwent the transformation, must have been a cell that had the potential both to capture the Philadelphia chromosome and give rise to differentiated progeny. So this idea of lineage markers has been a powerful uh, tool in the context of both cancer biology and in the context of uh, developmental biology as well. So tumor progression, this idea that it's driven by genetic instability to give to a more diverse population over time, is something that was implicit in what Noel had drawn as a diagram, and many people believed cancer was as a, as a disease process. But this immediately begged the question, well, where does genetic instability come from? What in the, part, in the tumor is really driving this process, and can we find more evidence for it? And uh, my colleague here, who I did a portion of my training with, Larry Loeb, he was a child of the 60s, and this is his tie-dyed lab coat sort of showing it off with his DNA tie, this was a good day, um, wrote a, a really interesting conceptual paper in the early 70s where he said, well, one of the most obvious places that mutations could come from in the context of cancer would be in the context of replicating DNA. You can't divide unless you replicate your DNA and segregate it to daughter cells. This is not a perfectly faithful process. And as a result, if you affected what's, what Larry called the fidelity of DNA synthesis, you could affect the genetic stability of offspring. And a simple hypothesis here was that errors in this process could be an important driver of malignant change. This was largely conceptual at the time he proposed it. It was speculative. Um, but there were three er ideas in tr you know, inherent in this idea, which was that tumors express a mutator phenotype because they have to accumulate more genetic change than we see in a typical tissue. These mutations must in some way disrupt normal processes. Again, think about an inability to maintain the normal number of cells 
or to differentiate those completely. And Larry's idea that there was a mutator hypothesis, more mutations in tumor cells than in normal cells, led to the idea that many mutations were probably accumulating on individual cell level in different tumors. Again, at the time he proposed this, he did not have the analytical tools to really run this problem into the ground. And this has really been the revolution of the last decade as those tools are available. And this story, I think, we now have abundant data on to uh, document each of these different aspects. And this has come from um, comprehensive cancer genomics efforts that uh, individuals in genome sciences and at the University of Washington have contributed powerfully to. There have been several comprehensive cancer genomics efforts. The Cancer Genome Atlas, TCGA, is one of the most prominent of those that is driven largely uh, by U.S. investigators. The International Cancer Genome Consortium is a second one here. And these are trying to take large numbers of tumors of specific types and understand their genetic composition. And many of the results of these are accumulated in their websites and also in secondary databases, such as this one called COSMIC, which is a catalog of mutations that have been found in tumor cells that are present only in the tumor cells of an individual and not in their normal cells. And I think you can see from the most recent version of COSMIC that was updated at the end of last year, this database has examined a million tumor samples, and they have documented two, th two million unique mutations in the portions of the human genome that actually encode a gene product. So I think you can see there's ample evidence for mutations in tumors and quite a few mutations in many tumors. Another aspect of this is when people tried to um, actually measure the number of mutations in a given tumor type. And it's a little bit hard to read across the top, but this is a list of different tumors where people have measured the number of mutations that are present in the tumor cells only of an individual for each type. And I think the important thing here is there's a curve. And the range that's displayed on this graph, this is an exponential graph, there's a million-fold range. So you can see that there are some tumors, such as melanomas or lung adenocarcinomas, that in some instances have enormous numbers of mutations. Again, thinking back to the idea that there must be an abnormal mutagenic process, a mutator phenotype in some of these that could be driving what's going on. But this, I think, was a, an interesting and an important conceptual diagram we'll come back to uh, at the very end when we talk about the impact of mutations on therapy and some interesting twists that have come to light just recently. So here's my summary slide of uh, part two, and I decided to do this in the form of two quotes. The first of these at the top is from the Cancer Genome Atlas that emphasizing again that cancer is a disease of genomic alterations, sequence changes, changes in the number of uh, individual genes, the arrangement of those, and the modification of those together drive the development and progression of human malignancies. So this is their assessment on the basis of all of those sequencing data that I showed you, that if we look, we can find the evidence, and the evidence argues that this is a genetic process, and mutations are an important part of the natural history or the evolution of this process. A more fanciful summary uh, is by uh, Wyatt Gibbs. He's a science writer, and this is a quote that was focused on cancer genetics in uh, 2003 that I think encapsulates a lot of the thinking, which is that it's useful to think of cancer as a consequence of a chaotic process that combines Murphy's Law and Darwin's Law. Anything that can go wrong will, and in a competitive environment, the best will adapt, survive, and prosper. So this is an, a verbal expression of that idea of genetic instability driving the evolution of a tumor tumor progression writ large. So I want to turn to the last of the topics that I wanted to cover tonight, which is if cancers, in fact, are diseases of mutation accumulation, how can we begin to use that information to identify better therapies? And my poster child for this is one that I'm sure many of you know, um, but I thought it's useful because it was the first that garnered people's attention and showed proof of concept that an idea that many people thought could be possible, in fact, worked in practice. And we're coming back again to our disease example that I've introduced twice already, this disease, chronic myeloid leukemia, the Philadelphia chromosome 1 disease. Here's our minute chromosome. 
as it was identified in 1960. In 1973, uh, one of my mentors, Janet Rowley, made an interesting observation. She said, well, that minute chromosome, in fact, is not all that's going on in this disease. That minute chromosome is a representation of the fact that two different chromosomes, chromosome 9 and chromosome 22, have undergone a rearrangement and they've exchanged portions of their genetic information. And in the process of doing that, they've made a fusion chromosome, a long one, and they've made this little short one here as the two products. And this fusion gene now expresses an aberrant gene product. This is a dysregulated and overexpressed kinase that is probably important, as they thought at that time, and as Janet Rowley and others subsequently showed, is important in driving CML as a disease process. If this is an essential part of the early phase of CML development and it persists and it's a marker for this disease process and we have a disease protein associated with it, the idea came to mind immediately, well, can we find a way to interfere with the function of this mutationally generated abnormal fusion gene and interfere with CML as a disease process. <clears throat> and that's, in essence, the story of Gleevec, uh, STI-571 or imatinib or other names by which it goes. And I want to start up here in the upper right-hand corner. This thing that looks like a fanciful tree is actually is, is a tree of relatedness of the 700-odd kinase genes that all of your genomes encode that in normal life do myriad aspects of normal physiology, cell signaling, and cellular maintenance. P because kinases are of such high biological interest, people have been trying to develop molecules called kinase inhibitors that had specificity for individual kinases or related groups of kinases. And one of the first of these that was discovered was this molecule that was assembled from several different pieces and it targeted one portion of the kinome, as people refer to it here, of different related kinases in the body. And it's this portion of the kinome, this is where the BCR Abel kinase that's formed by that oncogenic translocation in the CML resides. And this particular compound, it turns out, inhibits that fusion kinase and several other kinases in this portion of the kinome tree. There are several derivatives of this that are shown here that have different degrees of specificity or lack of specificity. All three of these are, in fact, in clinical use at this point, and they're alternative choices if you develop a form of chronic myelogenous leukemia that's resistant to this disease. When Brian Drucker, who's shown here, showing off his tattoo, this is Gert Boyle. This is not his mother, even though her tattoo says, one mean mother. She's the CEO of Columbia Sportswear, and she supports cancer research at OHSU. Um, but um, when uh, Brian was developing this story, when they started to apply this first to CML cells and showed that they could selectively kill cells with these kinase mutations in CML, and they took this into the clinic, they found that individuals with CML that were treated with Gleevec had remarkable survivals. They went from having a high risk of developing progressive disease and acute leukemia and dying of this to something that now became largely a chronic disease in over 90% of those patients. In many of the patients, this is a durable response. Uh, for the individuals who develop resistance to Gleevec, there are additional inhibitors that can be used to maintain long disease-free survival. So this is an example in which a mutation was understood at the molecular level. Its function was already known. An inhibitor of the mutant gene product that was important for driving the disease process was identified, and the clinical use of that inhibitor was shown to influence the natural history or the progression of chronic myelogenous leukemia to intermediate phase or to what's called blast crisis, acute leukemia. This example was powerfully galvanizing, and it was really a proof of concept that if we understood the mechanics of what was going on, had small molecules that could interfere and had defined targets, we could improve survival not only for CML, but we might be able to do this for many other types of cancer. Another strategy um, where we don't have as much mechanistic information, but we've got better ways to look for solutions is being pursued by my colleague Pam Becker, who works at the SCCA and also at Southlake Union. <clears throat> 
Pam has taken cells from individuals with acute leukemia, a different uh, uh, type of leukemia, and she's asked how sensitive they are to many different drugs. And the fourth speaker in this series, Tony Blau, is going to talk about this. He put together what we refer to as the Oncoblau 160 library, which is a large library of 160 different chemically distinct compounds, including drugs like uh, imatinib or Gleevec. And Pam can screen any individual leukemia patient's cells against all of those drugs at once in a three-day window. So she can look and see what drugs that individual is sensitive to, what they're somewhat sensitive to, and what they're clearly resistant to, and make an informed decision about the choice of therapy in that patient before therapy begins. And this is a key aspect of the direction this field is going, that we want to be able to do this type of either genomic or functional interrogation and have data back before you have to make a therapeutic decision because we want to identify these guys and avoid these. As one proof of concept, Pam in December reported at the American Society of Hematology meeting, um, these are four of a series of 15 patients that had failed anywhere from three to five different therapeutic regimens for leukemia. So these are people that we typically have nothing left to offer she applied this screening strategy to cells from these individuals. They had never been looked at um, prior to this, and identified in each of these individuals anywhere from one to three drugs that when applied in the test tube reliably killed their cells, and when used in patients could be shown to reduce the number of circulating um, leukemia cells in their blood, in some cases to zero, and in some cases uh, up to a year. So this is an example of an empirical approach that can be taken where you don't have the detail we had in the case of the Gleevec uh, case to still identify things that are practically useful on a short timeline. This is another example of trying to do the same thing not on a blood tumor like leukemia, but on solid tissue. And this is being developed with uh, colleagues in bioengineering and neurosurgery. And it is trying to take into account the fact that the way we've thought about cancer is a cellular process, but we've not thought about it as a tissue. And a lot of the response of cancer to a chemotherapeutic agent or radiation is really determined by its tissue context. So we wanted a way to take a piece of a tumor tissue out in all of its complexity and screen it, as Pam had done, for what drugs it was sensitive to and what it was resistant to. And the way we're doing that is with uh, a little microfluidic chip that is shown here. This is a plate that's about this big, and it's something that you can set up and run in a normal lab. You put your tissue right here on the little chip in the middle, and it's a little bit hard to see, but the stripes here, each one of these stripes represents a different drug that can be delivered to that portion of the tissue. So we can do, at least at this point, for 80 drugs, what um, uh, Pam was able to do for 160 drugs, and we hope to eventually extend this up to as many as 6,000 drugs that we can screen on an individual piece of the in a patient's tumor, direct tumor, to look at the response of that tumor in its tissue context. The disease we're focusing on here is glioblastoma, uh, the most malignant of the brain tumors, and this is one where we, we desperately need new therapeutic alternatives. We've had none in the last 25 years. Um, the last concept I want to introduce is the idea of synthetic lethality um, and how, again, a recognition of genetic change and the dependencies that those genetic changes or mutations create in cells can be taken advantage of. And the specific example I want to illustrate, and I'll just jump straight to the example here, are breast tumors that are mutant in the breast cancer-associated genes, the BRCA genes 1 and 2. These are the genes that Mary Claire was on the hunt for uh, earlier in her career and continues to study today. If you're BRCA mutant, you're missing an important pathway that fixes errors that arise during the replication of DNA. Again, think back to Larry Loeb's mutator hypothesis and that replication errors might be an important part of driving cancer. So BRCA uh, uh, mutate, mutant tumors are defective in this process, but they're still living as tumors, and that's because there are salvage pathways that can take things that are damaged, and even though it can't go this route, there are other ways to repair that damage, complete replication, cell division, and persistence of the tumor. When the recognition that this defect was there and that there was a salvage pathway was identified, people said, well, 
if we can find a way to block this salvage pathway in a b r c a deficient tumor unrepaired genetic damage is going to be replicated and that could be lethal so we're looking for a synthetic effect between a mutation that's tumor specific and a functional defect we can create with an inhibitor of a salvage pathway that allows b r c a mutant tumor cells to persist which is this single strand break repair pathway when we block this with what are called parp inhibitors after the name of the protein that they inhibit unrepaired dna damage goes into replication and this leads in the absence of the normal repair pathway and an inability to deal with these before replication to cell death and i think many of you know that um, b r c a mutant tumors are being treated with parp inhibitors where you're looking for what's called a synthetic lethal effect between a tumor specific mutation and the inhibition of a survival or a salvage pathway in those tumors so this strategy has led to an enormous amount of activity trying to identify additional proteins that in conjunction with tumor specific defects can be used as new uh, therapeutic approaches and might be particularly successful as has been shown by the BRCA mutant example uh this is close to the end um i want to talk for a second about the idea that mutations even though we've been discussing them and thinking about them as bad news in certain instances may in fact give provide us some therapeutic leverage and there are two ideas here that i want to introduce one of these um flows from the idea that many mutations if they affect a gene or a protein in fact interfere with the normal function of that protein and can be considered deleterious and from that the idea if tumors are highly mutant over this million fold range as we discussed there are probably a subset of tumors out here on the right hand end that have what we call a high mutational load that are probably close to some tipping point we don't know where that tipping point is that by either interfering with a repair pathway a la the parp inhibition in brca mutant tumors or by adding additional genetic damage could in fact push them over the limit a colleague of mine in uh, pathology alan her in fact has investigated this in yeast and has defined what that threshold is in yeast and is attempting to understand where that is now and to place where that limit is on is it tenfold above this or is it higher or might it in fact be lower in the context of specific tumors there's a second aspect of tumorigenesis that is influencing therapy and this is going to be, have a powerful influence i think on newly developed immune therapies for cancer that many of you have read about these are things that are called checkpoint inhibitor therapies or chimeric antigen receptor t cell therapies and these depend upon the immune system in the body recognizing and attacking the tumor and this depends on a critical distinction of the tumor as not self your immune system works and protects you from invaders microbial microbial or otherwise because it can distinguish between what's you and what's not you it either comes from inside or is generated in the body um the immune therapies that are discussed here an important part of especially the chimeric antigen receptor therapies depend upon the generation of antigens in tumors that are recognized as not self and as a result can mount an immune response and mutations can create many of these by interfering with the normal function of proteins that are expressed by tumor cells so one of the ideas that um was discussed is as little as 2 weeks ago at uh, a retreat that was held here in Seattle is that a subset of tumors at the right hand end of the spectrum are the ones that are likely by virtue of the fact that they're already highly mutant and may have a large number of these tumor specific antigens or non self epitopes might be the most effective to target by the newly developed immune therapies that involve engineering t cells to attack the tumor or using antibodies to inhibit the tumor's um interference with an immune response to that tumor. <clears throat> so here's a summary for section 3. Um mutations identify new targets and mechanisms. We've had targeted therapy proof of concept of several different types. I've shown you two in the context of chronic myelogenous leukemia and BRCA. and there are many new mutation and pathway targeted therapies that have been revealed and are being pursued both in academic and in industrial labs at this point um the example from um pam uh, becker and my colleagues in bioengineering and neurosurgery uh 
is that we can complement this, even if we don't have a deep mechanistic understanding of what's going on, by better screening tools to identify things that are still useful therapies and identify them quickly so you can make an appropriate decision before you start therapy. You want to know if you're going to give anti-cancer therapy that it has a high likelihood of being effective. So you want to make a good choice at that point. The need now, and this is something that, that uh, we're pursuing in the context of a program grant, is to try to develop the tools that we're going to need to explore therapeutic regimens and figure out how to apply these new approaches, be they um, mutation targeted, be they pathway targeted, or they, be, they, uh, be they something such as the integration of chemotherapy and immune therapies for particular types of tumors. I want to say um, one minute, a couple of words about where you can find reliable information about cancer. And I thought it was important to include this at the end of my talk because many of you will be asked about cancer or where you get information. Your first impulse, I'm sure, as everyone's is, is to turn to the internet. And regrettably, there's far more misinformation and misleading information in the internet than there is reliable information. Three places you can go where you will get reliable information on cancer, cancer diagnosis, cancer therapy, and cancer trials are the National Cancer Institute website, and the homepage that I'm showing here is for what's called their PDQ Cancer Information Database. These give tumors listed by the name of the tumor, and you can get either a, a lay version of all of the data that's there or one that's appropriate for health professionals, keyed to the current literature and curated by a combination of scientists and physicians. This is updated on a regular basis. Equally important, you can get these not only for all the common adult and pediatric tumors, but you can get these in English and in Spanish at this point. This is extremely reliable and a useful place to go for several types of information, whether you want to look at clinical trials, specific types of cancer and the treatment for those, or cancer statistics. Another place that provides um, solid information and updates it on a regular basis is the American Cancer Society. They publish every year something called Cancer Facts and Figures. You can download this whole thing. It's typically about a 100-page book. as a free PDF, and they'll give you many of the statistics. I've copied a few of those into this talk. And they also have special reports, such as this one on global cancer facts and figures. A third place is the CDC, which has more of a focus on global cancer risk. They uh, sponsor the Global Cancer uh, Atlas online. And a fourth that's a local resource is the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation here in Seattle. Um, this is uh, Chris Murray's uh, uh, shop. And even though its fo focus has been largely on global health issues, they have a lot of information here about cancer. And they've got a lot of impressive mapping and visualization tools. Um, the Gates Foundation recognized the value of this and put a lot of money into bringing this online so people can use this as a resource, whether your interest is infectious disease, cancer, or things that might contribute to premature disability or death uh, worldwide. So uh, Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation, IHME, if you search this, uh, it will pop up and you can, you can find this easily and begin to explore it, uh, looking at some of their tools and resources. If you like to read, in contrast, to web browse, um, there are two books. I'm sure uh, many of you are familiar with the one on the left here. Uh, this is uh, a book that was published uh, two years ago, won a Pulitzer Prize, um, and it served as the basis for a PBS series of the same name, The Emperor of All Maladies, a biography of cancer, a provocative uh, subtitle. Sid Mukherjee is a clinical oncologist. He's been interested in leukemia, and he's he did a really interesting job of trying to assemble several stories that involved history, the development of therapy, and the human side of cancer in this book. Um, it's a really interesting, very well-written book, and, and I'm impressed that he was able to do as effective a job as he was bringing these stories together. If you want the technical side of this story, Bob Weinberg, who uh, played a seminal role from 1980 forward in developing our understanding of cancer genetics, just published a second version of his book, The Biology of Cancer. This is not light bedtime reading, but if you are interested in the details of specific aspects of what I've talked about um, or more detail on certain aspects of cancer or cancer treatment, uh, Weinberg is a great place to start at a high level. So I think uh, that's the last of what I've got to say. Um, a quick slide of thanks. Nobody does work in this field without lots of help and lots of input.
phenomenal faculty colleagues here in the departments of genome sciences, pathology, the Hutch Children's, and ISB. We have a National Cancer Institute funded uh, grant that we heard this morning. We're good for five more years. We're going to pursue this story with a group of colleagues. There are a group of people in my lab that have developed a lot of this work and continue to pursue it with vigor. We have uh, colleagues at the South Lake Union uh, Stem Cell Institute that do the high throughput screening that I discussed, and our benefactors and sponsors down here, the National Cancer Institute, have been steadfast, uh, with the exception of one week lapse in the last 25 years. So I'll stop at this point. Be happy to take questions. I'll be around after, and there are refreshments outside.